it's a it's an entity of God. So if you capitalize Jesus or God, you should capitalize Holy Spirit because they're three in one. People want to like discount the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, you're not capitalized. I don't know where they get that. Okay. These things are things I'm correcting often. What? You found it. What is it? John 11.35. John 11.35. Thank you. I just wanted the trivia ones. There we go. No. <laughs> there she yep. Okay. Now, if you are writing about Jesus, more about Rome. 
opens, but I'm just giving you a heads up. Those are some of the questions that will be on your so final exam. We get the we get the theme paper on Christmas. Right? Uh huh. So it's Tuesday unless of course you want to just quote the Beatitudes to me. I mean the Sermon on the Mount. But I'm, I'm still you're still thinking about. Um, I feel like you should be past the thinking right? about it. <laughs> <laughs> God's judgment poured out God to man. 
okay? Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation, okay? But look back through scripture, think of times of God's judgment, okay? Noah and the flood, what did God do with his people? He killed all the people, but what did he do with the ones who were following him? Save. Save them. He pulled them out of it. Okay? What about Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened there? That's an, that's an example of God's wrath. Man cannot make hailstones come down from heaven. Like, I can't trivialize Jackson with fire hailstones. Like, <laughs> that's not, that's not going to happen. Okay? So, what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? God said, I'm going to destroy you. It was God's judgment or God's wrath. What did he do with the people who were righteous? Yeah, he saved Lot and his wife and his two daughters. Okay? And Lot's wife? Yeah. Do you know what, do you want to, do you know what Lot said to his wife as they were leaving Sodom and Gomorrah? Hey, is somebody following us? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> what? I don't think so. It was a joke. It was a joke, Carson. But then she turned the soul. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good joke. She's a pillar of her community. There's another one. Yeah. She's a pillar of my community. That's for sure. Okay. So, verse 9. God has not destined us for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, tribulation is man to man. Wrath is God to man. Okay? Um, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 10, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another. Build one another up just as you are also doing. Verse 13, that you may esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Verse 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. That's a hard one. How are you doing on being patient with everyone? <laughs> I have people in my life that I call small dose people. I can handle them in small doses because they're hard to be patient with. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. If you want God's will, these are God's will verses, okay? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you. In Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise pro prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Okay? There's a pretty good list. If you're like, man, what is God's will for my life? And you're just really searching for that? Read those verses. Okay? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Whose job is our sanctification? Whose job is it? It's God's job, but we, but we allow him to work with us, too. It's a relationship. It's a two-way. We, He says, be sanctified. Abstain from sexual immorality. Right? And then he says, now may the God who sanctifies you. What does he say? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Okay? It's a two-way street. If you go, God, I'm going to live exactly how I want. Go ahead and sanctify me. Is he going to be able to make you holy? No. 
If you go, I'm going to do this all on my own, are you going to be able to make yourself holy? <laughs> no. It's a two-way street. It's a submitting to his will. Okay? Verse 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body. Okay? There's where we get this three idea. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. Now may your spirit, your soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you. He also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What a blessing as he goes, right? What a blessing. I love verse 24. Faithful is he who calls you. Go back to that verse in Philippians that says, he will, how does it go? He will complete the work he has begun in you. Okay, that's a total botch paraphrase. But that idea of like, he will complete it. He's faithful. He's sanctifying you. He's working in you. Keep your heart right before him. Stay in relationship with him. Say yes. Basically, that's what Christianity boils down to. Say yes. Just say yes to God. Okay? Do you want to be saved? Yes. You want to follow me? Yes. You want to go be a missionary in Africa? Yes. Like, just say yes to God. It's the easiest thing. <laughs> Christianity is a good thing, guys. It is. <laughs> Simply. Si simplify. That's the word. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 1. There's a, there's a wise statement from Hannah, right? Christianity is a good thing. <laughs> hey, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, my grandpa gave me this example and I had never forgotten it. He didn't use a banana, but we're going to use a banana. Okay? When it says in Jesus Christ, Each one of you toward one another 
grows ever greater. So they're doing it. They're growing in the faith. They're growing in loving each other. Thessalonians 1 ends with that, right? Seek what is good for one another. Okay? Verse 5. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. Verse 4 talks about how they're going through persecutions and afflictions. It says this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. This concept is often through scripture. I would challenge you to study it out, okay? After the disciples, uh, Peter, Peter and John, I'm pretty sure it was, they got beat and they went home rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer. Okay? And this verse, he says, you, so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. There is a point, and I haven't like studied this out a ton, but scripturally, there's a point where suffering equals worthy. Okay? He goes, you're worthy to suffer for the kingdom of God. Nobody wants this. Okay? I, the last thing, I used to have like nightmares as a child that we were in the middle of like end times and my dad was going to prison because he was a pastor and like all these things. And they terrified me. Getting older, I'm looking and going, hey, there's a point where we're worthy to suffer for what God is doing. It's not a super, that was not preached very often on Sunday mornings, okay? And I don't have a ton to share on it because I haven't like studied it out a ton, but it's this concept that comes up quite frequently. Verse 6, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. So, when we deal with tribulation or difficulty, God will repay. We will get to this in Revelation. There's a whole bunch of saints up around the throne that have been martyred for their faith. And they're going, God, when? When are you going to repay? And he tells them, wait, look, it's coming. Okay? So there's a point. There's, there's all these things tied together. We're, we're worthy to suffer, and then God will deal with it. Um, verse 6. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. If you fight back, that's not the way it works. You're suffering for the Lord. Okay? And to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Just a casual statement. Like, eh, when Jesus comes back, oh, with his mighty angels in flaming fire. <laughs> Think of how intense lightning is. Okay? Think of how intense lightning is. I don't, have you ever seen sheet lightning? Like, I'm assuming you guys have seen, like, a bolt of lightning. Have you ever seen sheet lightning? I was in Montana, and they had a lightning storm, and it was like a sheet of lightning. It wasn't a bolt, and it would, it was so bright, okay? And that's God's creation. Think of when he comes back with a flaming fire. It's not going to be like a little match, like, hey, well, right? It's going to be a big deal. Verse 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord. Okay? All of a sudden it goes from tribulation to God's judgment and Jesus' return. Right? This is, this is, it goes from like man to man real quick from God to man. Okay? Verse 9, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Hell. 
all right? And I have, I wasn't really friends with, but I worked with this guy who was Seventh-day Adventist, and he was really weird to do ministry with because he didn't believe in hell. He thought Christians were, like, rewarded with heaven, but bad people just ceased to exist. And I was like, then what's the point? Like, why work hard to share the gospel if they just cease to exist? Okay? Biblically, here it is. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's what hell is. Separation from the presence of God. Okay? It's not like Oh, it's hellish because people are beating you with sticks or making you work harder. You know, we see all the cartoons like fire and all these things. The reason it's hell is that it's a separation from God. Okay, I heard of this Romanian pastor who had been imprisoned. And they told him, just deny your faith and we'll let you go be with your family. And he was super lonesome. He was struggling. He missed his family so bad. And they gave him this proposition, like, if you deny your faith, we will return you to your family the same day. Like, we're, we'll be done. And he, he was talking, and he said he stepped back into his cell, and he was met with the deepest, darkest loneliness he had ever felt in his entire life. And he realized this is what life without God would feel like. And he turned around and said, like, absolutely not. I will not. I will not deny my faith. Okay? Because the definition of hell is being away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you is believed. 11. This, to this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling. Okay? So he says walk worthy. And then he says, we pray that God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith and power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, okay? So Jesus is coming back. These are things we need to know. He says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it is from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Okay, in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, they believe they've missed the rapture. Okay, they're struggling with this idea of like, did we somehow miss the rapture? Did we miss Jesus' is coming? Yes, it does taste like banana, Carson. <laughs> okay. Haven't you ever heard of banana-infused water? It tastes better than, like, cucumbers in it. It says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed. So they're, they're being disturbed. They're being shaken. They're like, did we miss it? Did we miss the rapture? Rats! Now what? Okay. Verse 3, it says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy come. Okay, so we're all waiting for the rapture. Clearly, we have not been raptured. This hasn't happened yet. So this is for us, okay? The rapture will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction. We don't have time to read all of it, but right in that margin, Matthew 24. Okay? Yeah. So my Bible says until the fallen away comes. Mm -hmm. So what are between that and apostasy? What is that saying? What does that mean? Look it up in other verses. It talks about before Jesus coming, there will be a falling away. And Hannah opinion here, okay? Not biblical opinion. Hannah opinion here. I think that will be like a refining of the church or a like weeding out all the people who kind of go, well, yeah, I'm a Christian because I was born in America. That idea. So like there will be a falling away. I 
think a lot of Christians may be deceived. Um, it's, I would study that out. Okay, that's, that's like Hannah opinion. But I would study that out because there are several times it mentions like the great apostasy or the falling away or uh, people being misled. Those are words to look up that will give you a lot of verses on that. Um, the man of lawlessness is revealed. Look up Daniel 7. Let's go to Daniel 7. Daniel is having visions of the end time, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but go to Daniel, read all of Daniel 7 if you want the whole vision, but we're going to start with 23, okay? He says, thus he says, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. Okay. We'll get into this a lot more when we go through Revelation, but there's this idea of one world government, one world religion, and one world currency, okay? So this political power will take possession of the whole earth, okay? Um, it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest, of the highest one. And he will attend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given to it into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. A time is a year, times is two, and half, half a time is half a year. Okay, so like three and a half years. Okay, but the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away annihilated and destroyed forever. Underline this verse. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming, and my face grew pale, and I kept the matter to myself. It kind of freaked him out. Okay, so this is talking, as far as I understand it, I do not claim to be an end times know-it-all. Giving that disclaimer now. But it's talking about this, this antichrist and this, like, the, the destruction and chaos of the end times, okay? So the, the lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object. We're back to Thessalonians 2.4 or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God and displaying himself as being God. This has to happen before the tribulation. This apostasy and this man setting himself up. It says he will take his seat in the temple of God and proclaim himself as a God. Okay? This is this man of destruction. Okay? So if you see, like, one world government stuff kind of happening. Like, I believe that that there are things that have to be set in place yet before Jesus is returned. Okay? There's, because it says, like, these things will happen before he comes. Okay? Go to Revelation. Hold on, wait. Verse 5 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Okay. So we have the mystery of salvation. Verse 7. I noticed this. The mystery of lawlessness. <laughs> Here's Hannah thoughts again. Okay. I believe there's a lot about end times that we just don't get to know. It's a mystery. Okay? And this mystery of lawlessness. You know, 
I can tell you what I believe end times will sort of look like, maybe kind of biblically. Like I can show you the verses that I'm like, man, this is kind of what I build my belief on. But I believe there's this mystery. What does what does New King James say? Does it use the word mystery? Two verse five. Two verse seven. Chapter two verse seven. The mystery of lawlessness. Okay. What about ESV? Two verse seven. Okay. So. So this hit me when I was reading and getting ready for this class. Like, oh, <laughs> the angels desired to look into the, the mystery of salvation. Now we have this mystery of lawlessness that just showed up. Okay? The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he has taken it out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Okay, so I can read Revelation and get myself super psyched out. Like, what if we can't handle the end times? Look what our God does with this evil, horrific man. He says the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. This guy's not a big deal, okay? He's a big deal, but our God is so much bigger, so much more powerful. Like, he doesn't even have to sword fight him. He just, like, slays him with the breath of his mouth. Go to Revelation 19. Do you know how hard it is treading into end times? Because so many people have so many different opinions. Uh, Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one, except, no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Read John 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. Okay? So his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God and the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of the commanders and the flesh of the mighty men, and all the flesh of the horses of those who sit on the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. Okay? And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Okay? I would say this is what some people would say the battle of Armageddon. This is just a battle. Okay? Good versus evil. And look at how it ends. Like they're all assembled to make war. Okay? This is how it ends. Ready? Imagine this in a movie and how anticlimactic it would be. And the beast was seized, and with it the false prophet to perform the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burned with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with, his blood, with their flesh. Okay, that's how the battle goes. Here comes Jesus, and here comes the beast and the Antichrist and all these horrific evil men, the kings of the earth. They would set themselves against the Lord, and like poof, they seize the beast, throw him into the fire, and then God's word just kills them. Like, it's just dealt with, right? There's no, like, war cry. There's no clashing of shields and armor. There's no battle. The, the fight is completely over. Okay, so go back to Thessalonians, verse 8. 
It says, Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Poof. Done. Dealt with. Okay? Now, I can't give you all the timeline. I could, like, it's a mystery, I think. Okay? But Jesus says these things have to happen before, like, this stuff's happening. Okay? Verse 10, and all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive, notice this, they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. These are the people who are with this horrific man. They didn't receive, notice how the gospel is called the love of the truth. How loving the gospel. How loving is it when we share the truth with people? Imagine you have the cure all to cancer. Would you tell people? Yeah. Okay, you have a cure to a far greater disease. Tell people. Be a witness of it. Okay, go to verse 13. He says, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith and truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the tradition which you were taught, whether by the word of mouth or by letter from us, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by glory, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work. Okay? These things have to happen before we get, before the tribulation. You guys didn't miss it. Okay? Keep living, loving, following the Lord. Okay? Go to chapter 3, verse 3. It says, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. If end time stuff scares you, read this verse. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Okay? I'm going to tell you honestly, the end time stuff, there's an element of unknown. It's kind of like that idea of I'm not afraid to die. I'm a little bit afraid of how I die. Right? I'd really like it to not be super painful. Like, like I'd like to not get eaten by a shark. I'd like, like, you know, but I'm not afraid of death. Does that make sense? It's kind of that way with end time stuff. Like, it's an unknown. It's a mystery. There's things that I'm like, I don't know. And it's easy to let fear come in. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the traditions which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. He goes, if, you're, if there are brethren in the church who aren't acting like royalty, don't hang out with them, okay? You saw how we walked, worthy of the calling, okay? Pay attention to that. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Oh, how our society would change if we followed this verse. Um, it would change a lot. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. If you don't have a job, you tend to become a busybody, okay? Now jobs look like all different things. Get up and go to work, work at eight to five. Get up, be a mom, work at noon to midnight. I mean, a, a midnight to midnight, what's 24 seven? That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, like there are jobs, but if you don't have something you're doing, you you tend to become a busybody or a gossip. Okay, how many of you have seen Anna Green Gables? Oh my word, you guys I'm need to. The Anna Green Gables with with do you know who Rachel Lind is? 
the little nosy neighbor who you guys can watch me. Watch Anne of Green Gables. That's your job this week. <laughs> not the like, not the like episodes, the like old one. Yeah, it's the best. Okay. <laughs> My example didn't work because you haven't seen it. <laughs> um, there's 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary in doing good. Guys, this process of sanctification takes work. This staying in the love of Christ, staying in relationship, it takes work. It takes diligence. It takes planting good seeds so you don't just end up with a field of weeds, right? It takes diligence. It takes perseverance. He says, don't grow weary while doing good. Okay? There's a little old lady in our church. How old is Charlotte? She's in her 80s, okay? A lot of you who have been to Fired Up know her because she takes her grandchildren to fire it up faithfully, okay? She's just this little old lady who <laughs> is like the most faithful, loves the Lord, disciplined, goes on mission trips. I've been to Mexico with her a couple times where it was like, are you gonna die on the trip? Like, please don't die while we're in Mexico. It'd be nice to not bring home a body. Like, you know, okay, but she's just faithful in the Lord. She's lived a quiet and peaceful life doing God's will. She knows her word like she knows the word of God. She's incredible. Be like her, right? Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't be like, you know what, I'm going to hit Christianity hard and then flatten out and retire. Don't retire in the Lord. Okay? Do not grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary in this process of being made holy. And it's work. Okay? It's way easier to be lazy. I was laying in bed last night thinking about some things that I was like, wow, I need to correct that. I've gotten lazy in that. I need to correct that and be more disciplined about that. Is it going to be easy? <laughs> Absolutely not. But it's something that God showed me that I need to pay attention to and be disciplined about and, and not grow weary in doing good. Okay? So don't grow weary in doing good. Verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this reading with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Any questions? Okay, we're going to look at homework. Today's March 9th. You were supposed to turn in a How Does Philippians Apply to Your Life? I told you to write a paper on how to walk worthy. Okay? So, we're good, okay? If you turned in your walk-worthy paper, we're good. Next week, it says a personal application paper. That's pretty much what you just turned in. So I want a theme study on Thessalonians, okay? Theme study. Remember, you pick... You pick a theme. What would you say is the theme of Thessalonians? What is the theme of Thessalonians? There's a lot of end time stuff. Okay, let's just go with this one. Do not grow weary. Do not grow weary while doing good, right? Okay, that's your thesis statement. That's your theme. The book of Thessalonians, one of the themes in the book of Thessalonians is do not grow weary while doing good. 
Now, your next paragraph is not just a random offshoot, okay? Most of you did super well with the, the theme studies. We're doing another one because we need more practice, okay? Do not grow weary in doing good. What is your next paragraph? Okay, you need to find three verses before you start writing. Three verses that defend your theme. Okay? So, uh, what would be one of those verses? Walk worthy. Okay? We're going to make that one of the things in do not grow weary while doing good. How do you do good? You walk worthy. Okay? There's that. Okay? What's another walk worthy or don't grow weary theme? How do we not grow weary? Rejoice, right? Rejoice, and then let's do the, may the God of peace, okay? The God of peace will help you not grow weary. Does that make sense? So you find three verses. Now, you write your next paragraph. So this is paragraph one, don't grow weary. Your next paragraph will be, we don't grow weary by walking worthy. Or we don't grow weary in walking worthy. God calls us to walk worthy. We need to be fully embracing this idea of sanctification and not growing weary while we're being sanctified. Okay? And that verse defends that thesis statement. Okay? Then you need to rejoice. One way we, or be thankful. Maybe that would be better. Thankful. Okay? Okay, so you have the be thankful always, or you guys always pray about the same thing, and everything gives thanks, okay? If you're thankful in situations, you won't grow weary of doing good, okay? So use that verse to defend that thesis statement. Then, uh, got a piece, I had to figure out what on earth I had written, okay? And then you have to remember that when we rest in the God of peace, we won't grow weary, okay? Does that make sense? So you have your three verses that defend your thesis statement. Then your last paragraph re-says your thesis statement. Any questions on that? Clear as mud? Are you stoked to write this paper? <laughs> Carson looks thrilled <laughs> to write this paper. Okay. He has grown weary of class. Okay. <laughs> Let's pray and be done. Lord, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you oh, that you win. Lord, we look at all the injustice in the world. We look at all the problems. We look at all the hurt and loss and heartache. And Lord, we just rejoice in the fact that you win. Lord, you don't even have to put up a big fight to do it. You just breathe out your righteousness. Lord, we're grateful for that. Lord, I pray that you be the God of peace in everybody's life here this week. They can just rest in who you are and rest in you and just rejoice in you. Lord, I pray you remind us to be thankful this week that you work in our hearts. And Lord, that we will continually walk worthy of what you have called us to do and be. We love you. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, saints, go have a good week. How many of you have written that on your mirror or somewhere you can see it? My mom and Felicia. That, you did it? Good. I, I, I see, I see that it. may be an end a final exam question. <laughs> we may have to add that.